Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. Um, we're going to do another producer episode. We're bringing Benny uh, to go uh, kind of volley back and forth. We're going to keep, uh, you know, I- I've always really enjoyed trying to mix the old with the new and taking things that are happening now and giving some historical context. Um, so we're going to kind of stick with our recent theme of uh, the great white north and uh mob activity organized crime activity up in canada quebec montreal and uh again shout out to the guys over at dirty news who do a great job covering the quebec underworld and uh those guys made me aware of a a cold case murder from about 40 years ago that i was unaware of and uh gave me a little bit of direction and, and where to find some uh, info. They, they did a little uh, piece on it. And uh, this is a mob murder from the fall of 1985. And uh, a criminal defense attorney, a mob attorney, a mob mouthpiece by the name of uh, Frank Shufi, who was a Lebanese uh, criminal defense attorney, high profile guy in uh, Montreal. And uh, his murder, even though unsolved, we can pretty much nail down the the, the reasons and the circumstances, uh, and those reasons and circumstances tied into professional boxing, uh, the role that uh, the mafia played in professional boxing, and in the mid nineteen eighties a face of professional or the two faces of professional boxing at that time, Don King uh, and Mike Tyson um, all kind of play a role in this story. Tyson more tangentially, but so we're going to talk about that a little bit and then maybe talk a little bit more in general about uh, Tyson and Don King's connections to the, uh, to the mafia and the mob and uh, just maybe just in general, the way, old school boxing was was ran uh benny thanks for uh joining me man for sure outside uh, of the glass oh. yeah from hide the wife from hide the, the children from the glass yeah 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 uh so benny were you ever i mean there's there's some you know age gap between benny and i a generation gap in one sense that i grew up in the 80s and 90s benny grew up in the late 90s throughout most of the 2000s I would and, say 2000s, uh, yeah. I was born in 94, so right. don't remember uh, too much of the 90s. But I remember when boxing was a big deal. Um, I'm sure Benny doesn't. <laughs> Benny, probably his first memory of the fight game, I'm guessing, was MMA-related? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, Floyd Mayweather, in his uh, okay, so earlier there was- years, there was hype around that. But yeah, MMA was what uh, really, uh, uh, I guess, uh, took off in the. And it's at a different stratosphere. Yeah, yeah. From um, boxing, boxing is a is. I hate to say it is just it's a dead sport, and I don't know if it's ever going to come back. I hope it does. I loved it. Uh, again, getting you know, <laughs> not having to go down a personal rabbit hole here, but. Boxing was one of my first loves in terms of uh, me falling in love with professional sports. I'm not into boxing now. I haven't been into boxing in a while. But when I was growing up in, like, again, in the 80s and 90s, I was a a big fight fan. And uh, my first two loves uh, in terms of sports were, were baseball and boxing, two things that I don't really care about um, as an adult. But those were really the two things that got me really into sports, then basketball, and then eventually football was kind of the last pro sport that I fell in love with. And now, for me, it's just it's all football. I mean, I, I, I still love basketball, but to me, that's just the only thing that really gets me excited. Uh, so, but, but boxing was a, was a really big deal on a big level when I was, you know, until it's just my, let's just say my first 15 years of life, you know, boxing had, you know, when were you had, born? What year were you born? 77. So like you're so 87, you were 10. Yeah. 
so ninety seven to a twenty. Okay. You're yep. in your in your um these were things that you saw on your television every day. These were athletes that were being promoted by sneaker companies and soda companies, car companies. They were on every Saturday and Sunday. I remember turning on the television with my grandpas, both grandpas, and watching boxing on NBC, CBS, ABC, uh, HBO. So, when we got, when we first got HBO, I got it, you know, say in the mid '80s. That's an important um, point right there. It was yeah. on national television. Yeah. And then if you got HBO, which was this a big deal when it first, you know, when you could watch tell you know, watch movies on your on your TV, um, they were their entire sports division was they had like the NFL Today show that they would run once a week with like highlights, and then the rest of their sports department was all boxing. So uh, let me ask you this. How often was there a big fight on back in the late 80s, early 90s? So that's another thing that I remember. The fights, those big fights were never, you could never catch them live. You would, they were all pay-per-view events. I mean, you, I shouldn't say you could catch them live, but you had to pay. You had to pay for it. You couldn't okay. sit uh, in, then in, and then at a point in the 90s, you could order it uh, on your, through your cable box, but you were still paying. You weren't just paying the regular fee for the HBO or your regular, you know, uh, hookup to have a television so you could have ABC, NBC, CBS. Gotcha. Um, but no you, big fights were free. They all cost. Not that. my memory. Yeah. I mean, that you could get some really good fights that you would see um, on those Friday or sorry, those Saturday and Sundays where they would have the the big big networks would have their boxing coverage. Those would always be like the lead ups. So you would see like number two contender fight number three contender to then have a have a shot to go fight Tyson or fight whoever uh, for a championship, and then that would be pay per view. Got you. So you could follow it all. You could follow the fighters kind of all the way up to the point where they became championships and uh, champions and were fighting for belts, then you would have to, you know, kind of, you know, not kind of, you'd have to pay for the right to watch it at that point. And back in the nineties, how much was the average pay-per-view? Back then? I don't like know. I just, I, I always lived with like, I lived in like a fraternity house and I always lived with a bunch of guys. I was never the one handling the, <laughs> just always chipping in, but I just oh, remember we would always buy the fights. Um, in the nineties, but in the eighties, sometimes I think you could watch it live on HBO. Uh, if you had HBO, you could watch those fights live. Um, other times I think HBO would have the right to put it out like a week after it had been on pay-per-view. Okay. Um, so like, I remember watching the sugar Ray marvelous Marvin fight in 87 or 88 but it was like a couple of days after it had been live, but I was watching it for the first time, like it was live on HBO. Got you. And these pay-per-view fights, was everybody watching them like the Super Bowl? Yes. Like a, okay. Yes. A Tyson fight in the nineties, the yeah, world Tyson. stopped in the eighties and nineties. The world stopped for Tyson fights. I mean, that's, those are my memories as a kid. Like you're like, it's a great analogy. Like it was like a Super Bowl. Uh, Tyson was a phenomena, like no other sports figure that I can imagine other than Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, um, you know, maybe like a you know Tom Brady, Steph Curry type now, but uh, he was just must-see action at all times. When he lost, it, it was just jaw-dropping <laughs> in 90, I think it was 91. 90 or 91 when he lost to Buster Douglas. Um, but let's just say from 85 to 91, that was the biggest ticket in professional sports outside of um, a Super Bowl or a Lakers, uh, Celtics, and, and NBA Finals. or so. And, and let's just, again, put it into context. The Mafia weren't just 
influential in the pro fight game. Um, organized crime, corruption, back deal wheeling and dealing. That's that's that was just the sport. You know, it, 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 you couldn't have one without the other. If you were a if you were a fighter and you wanted to fight and you had a group of people around you that could get you to a championship, you had to deal with the mafia in one one shape, form, or another. Was it mainly the five families? No, it was every was... Fa- it was every family. Every family. Okay. Almost, I shouldn't say every. Almost every family. So, um, you know, just first, Benny and I are both at people probably know this are uh, Detroiters. So Benny says that his, you know, his first memories of boxing come from Floyd Mayweather, who's a not a Detroiter, but a guy from Michigan who's a really proud uh, to be from the state of Michigan. He's from Grand Rapids, which is on the west side of the state. And uh, his dad was actually a, a big part of the Detroit fight game, um, even though his dad was from Grand Rapids, but his dad was a fighter and uh, trained uh, down in Detroit. But just in Detroit, we had... Uh, a couple guys that controlled all the boxing here. Little Sammy Finazzo uh, ran the Motor City Boxing Gym. I believe it was on Woodward. I think you can still find on YouTube some old NBC Saturday afternoon fights. I think this is from before I was paying attention to it. I think they're from like the 60s or 70s. And they're at the Motor City Boxing Gym. That's where the pro fights are happening. And they're being broadcast on national television. Um so little Sammy Finazzo ran the fight game here in um, in Detroit. He was a, a mob capo. Uh, in Philadelphia, you had guys like Frankie Carbo, uh, Blinky Palermo, Tony Meets Ferranti. Um, I know in St. Louis, Sonny Liston. Uh, the guys behind Sonny Liston were uh, the St. Louis Mafia, Johnny Vitale. Uh, and then, yeah, then the five families all had all, had their hooks into almost every fighter on the East Coast. And then they controlled the rankings. They controlled the 15 different sanctioning bodies. And then they could control who was getting what fights, which is how they would leverage their power. If you didn't want to play play ball with them, you weren't going to get a shot at the title, let alone win the title. Hmm. And was there a lot of throwing fights? Yes. Um, <laughs> Quite a bit. The, but like even in like the 80s and 90s. Probably not as much. But, but more so in the 50s and 60s. 50s and, I mean, just watch, watch Raging Bull. Um, he, you know, he had to throw a fight to get his shot at the championship. Uh, and his, Jake LaMotta had a, love hate relationship with the mafia there's some great scenes in that uh, movie with uh frank vincent who goes on to be billy bats and and uh other great you know other great characters in scorsese movies and then actually the the guy that played coach on cheers i think his name was nick colasanto he was the mob boss in raging bull um and he's great. And there's some great scenes there about him not wanting to play ball with those guys. I don't, I don't, I should, I should have done some more preparation for this. I don't know exactly who Lamada was dealing with. Uh, anybody in the comments, you can chime in uh, which New York guys were, were, uh, you know, making it so Lamada couldn't get a sh- title, title shot unless he, you know, helped them out. I know in Detroit, at that point, again, not to, to always bring it back to the Motor City, but that was a just like with a lot of other things in organized crime at that time. This was a a real hub, and uh, a lot of professional boxing's biggest fights were happening in Detroit from um, the days of Joe Lewis forward. Joe Lewis again, somebody who was uh, you know probably outside of uh, what Ali and um, Tyson and uh, Sugar Ray Robinson, uh, Rocky Marciano, I would say Jack Johnson. I mean, I would say uh, those guys are the icons, and you got Joe Lewis is probably at the top of it. Okay, let's get back on track. So I'm saying Joe 
point is Joe Lewis was being uh, was controlled by the mob. He was controlled by the black mob at that time who was working for the Italians in Detroit. So, Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Joe Lewis, so just from the days of Joe Lewis, Johnny Roxborough was Joe Lewis's uh, manager. Johnny Roxborough was one of the biggest uh, black policy number bosses in Detroit controlled a lot of black bottom uh, paradise Valley, which was uh, an area of Detroit that uh, bred a lot of great, athletes and and great entertainers and uh, that's where joe lewis uh spent most of his time in detroit anyway he yeah so he was and then when and then in detroit when it kind of moved into the 80s and you had tommy the hitman hearns he he was i don't want to say he was con cronk jim which is the Detroit kind of the boxing brand. Legendary gym. Yeah. Unfortunately uh, now closed, but. Right. And Manny, uh, RIP Manny Stewart, who is, you know, uh, I, I believe he trained 40, 41 champions, world champions. I think that's the most any, any trainer in pro boxing's ever had. Um, and, and Tommy Hearns was his protege, his, his first major champion. I think he had other champions, but his first real superstar. Uh, and and Tommy the Hitman was mob adjacent. Uh, I don't I don't want to um, say he was controlled by the mafia per se, but um, his entourage was filled with black gangsters. I mean that's a fact. There's a lot of pictures and videos out there of of Tommy Hearns going to the going to the ring on some of his biggest fights in the '80s, surrounded by like. Demetrius Holloway and Maserati Rick Carter, you know, some hardcore Detroit gangsters who he grew up with. Um, and then he comes up in a bunch of the FBI uh, investigations for um, hosting a lot of mob uh, gambling events at his uh, his mansion in the suburbs. All right, let's go. Back, let's go back to the original story that we we that we bury the lead on, but let's just talk about. It. We wanted to give give a little bit of a a. Uh, 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 precursor, a little, yeah, precursor, yeah. A, a, a table setter, a little um, aperitif, yeah, yeah. um, palate pleaser. So Frank Shufi was very high profile criminal defense attorney uh, in Montreal. Came to prominence in the media in the mid to late sixties. Uh, was representing his first, you know, big client. Uh, that, that got him a lot of publicity was an uh, independent gangster um, named Richie the Cat Blass. And they had a, I think he had a couple brothers and they opposed the, at that time, the reigning mafia empire in Montreal was the Catroni family. And the youngest Catroni brother, uh, Big Frank Catroni, was uh, uh, you know, a formidable force in his own right uh his um his older brother's oldest brother uh Vic Catroni aka the egg was uh you know he was kind of the Al Capone of Canada um until the Rizzutos and and what's going on over the last you know 40 40 years but uh, the Catronis were the the name brand mafia there and Frank Catroni controlled all the boxing in in Canada a lot of great Fighters came out of Canada, and uh, Frank Shufi made a name for himself as a criminal defense attorney. He represented these uh, Richie the Cat Blast, who was at war with the Catronis, and it got a lot of headlines back then. He also represented members of the Catroni family, uh, members of the Rizzutos, members of the Violis. Um, I think he represented some West End guys, Irish mob. Just a guy that was, you know, involved in politics, uh, served as a, a kind of a business counselor, and one of the people he was counseling for business and handling legal affairs uh, for was the Hilton family, which was a big boxing family in Montreal. Uh, the dad, David Hilton, trained his two sons, the Hilton brothers, Matthew Hilton and Davy Boy Hilton. Uh, both of them were world champions. Uh, Matthew Hilton, who this particular situation, uh, a contract between him and Don King, that's where this situation arose from. 
uh, was the junior middleweight champion in the IBF, I believe. Uh, his brother, Davey Hilton, was the super middleweight champion in the WBC. God, I, I didn't really know about these guys. For being for someone who claims to be a boxing aficionado, I never heard of the Hilton brothers, and I looked at their records. I mean, I think Matthew Hilton finished with a record of like 34 and 3. 32, 3 and 2. 32, right, 32 and 3. Um, yeah. So what I'm saying is they were commodities in the mid-80s. Frank Shufi had the ear of their father, who was their manager and their trainer. Frank Catroni was brokering uh, contracts for fights uh, at different major venues throughout throughout Canada, taking uh, uh, broker fees, finders fees, specifically with uh, Don King's fighters. Don King, you know, the got to be the most infamous, <laughs> famous, iconic, whatever you want to fight promoter of all time. You know, just the hair alone and the big personality and the, reputation for being a, 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 a well he he was a gangster um and then he remade himself as a as a, as a boxing executive and um it was always a lightning rod uh, but a pop culture personality and somebody that it was difficult to he was ubiquitous him and mike tyson at that time were just everywhere um and uh Frank Catroni was fighting extradition. He had a heroin case. He was gonna have to go do some time in in a prison in uh, New York, I believe. And uh he was banking on the contract that he was brokering for Don King and the Hilton brothers to pay that those legal fees. Mm. And Frank Shufi at this time, I think this is either. Can you look, Benny? Look up when Tyson got the belt. This this is October of eighty five. Tyson is either on the verge of getting the belt or it just got the belt. Uh, was it WBC champion when he beat Burbick? I think it was for his champ for the championship. He became the youngest heavyweight and he was twenty years old. November 22nd, 1986. Okay, so this was First a title fight against Trevor Burbick. Okay, so this was like, let's say, nine, uh, so what, 11 months? This was a little, no, this was 13 months. Thir- I can't do math. 13 months before Tyson takes the crown, but Tyson at that time is still a, you know, a rising star. I mean, it, it, this was when the buzz started with him. The uh, real life Clubber Lang. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And um, Don King was going to sign a contract to promote fights for Matt Hilton, two upcoming fights um, that were pretty relatively big name fights. Uh, The fight, uh, the first fight was like literally like a week after Frank Shufi's murdered in in Montreal in his office or right outside his office on October 15th 1985 and the reason the the investigators believe nobody's ever been charged was that Shufi had convinced Dave Hilton to not have his son sign that promotion contract with Don King where he was going to promote the October 20th fight against Vito Antifermo and a fight in February of 86 against Wilfred Benitez uh these were you know pretty big name people at the time and uh, then I think he was also had options to to promote some of Dave Hilton's fights. And Shufi told him not to do business with Don King. It was probably a good advice, but uh, it, it, it got him killed, according to what investigators believe. And what um, uh, what uh, Frank Catroni's former right hand man, bodyguard Real Samard, uh, who flipped, uh, told investigators that Catroni had put the hit out on Shufi. So, uh, it's, 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 it's interesting. I didn't know anything about it. And when I started to look into it, I talked to some of my sources up there, talked to some law enforcement, you know, this is just uh, stepping on the wrong people's toes. 
So do you think it was... Did Don King have any ties? Nah, so, so let's be... Yeah, let's, let's be clear. No, he... Well, yeah, he had ties with the Catronis. I mean, he was doing deals yeah. with the Catronis where the Catronis were kind of teeing up uh, fighters like this to do deals with in Canada and then taking a piece of the deals. Um, so it wasn't just Canadian fighters. It was like any fights that were taking place in Canada. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, there was a big fight. I don't remember where it took place, but it was against a Canadian fighter and everybody was all, they all thought, oh, this is the, there was always like, this is how my memory as a kid was. So it was like, there was always like the next guy. This is the one who's going to take on, this one's, this is the guy that's going to take down Tyson. This is the guy. Um, And it was Donovan Razor Ruddick, who was a Canadian fighter. Um, So stuff like that. So when Tyson was going to Canada, obviously King was going to promote it. And then he was trying to take the market in Canada for doing any and all promotions and, and the Catronis control the boxing market there. So, but Don King, we don't believe, right? Let's call the hit, right? Let's be clear Don King was never implicated in any yeah. um, wrongdoing or violence or anything shady in this particular situation. But <laughs> Don King is a convicted murderer, that's um, not a uh, not a secret. He uh, was convicted of second degree murder in the 1960s, uh, stomped the worker of his to death back before he became a um, boxing promoter. He was a never heard this story. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is not a secret. This is yeah. Cleveland. uh, He was a Cleveland racketeer in the fifties and sixties. He was a black mafia boss or mob associate to the Cleveland Italian mob ran all the numbers in Cleveland with his partner, Virgil Ogletree. And uh, I think it was 1966, got into a dispute with one of his numbers runners over 600 bucks and uh, killed the guy. Uh, I think King had to go do five years, four or five years. He might have been, got the sentence commuted or pardoned by the Ohio governor or something and then came out of prison and immediately jumped headfirst into the promotion game and was promoting Muhammad Ali within like a year or two. Re, you know, reinvented himself. But like, you can call Don King a murderer because he is a murderer. Uh, not first degree murder, but he, he was convicted of manslaughter, second degree murder. And uh, that... that uh, it says 1967. Couldn't he was convicted. Right. So what I'm saying is like when he came into the business, the general public might not have known that. I mean, I didn't know about it until... Ben didn't know about it until right I now. I didn't know about did it not until know about that at all. I didn't know about it until uh, I started studying this stuff. But uh, that you don't think that helps you in the in that business? Yeah, uh, people it, aren't gonna it, fuck it, with it, you it, like it, they would fuck with a Jewish promoter. That evokes fear. You yeah. Know? Um. So let's 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 wrap up by uh, talking about Tyson and. Um, not a lot of people know um, his ties into the mafia or the people that he was connected with. Um, he's He was a, um, I don't want to say he belonged. I think that's the wrong way to phrase it. But he was trained by Customato, who's a, a, a famous fight trainer who, who died in, uh, before he got a chance to see Tyson become champion. And what was so uh, unique about that situation was that Tyson became the youngest heavyweight champion of all time. And the person that he beat out for that achievement was Floyd Patterson, which had been Customato's first champion. Um, and, and Cus was a very uh, controversial figure uh, was kind of like fought the mafia but also was controlled by the mafia a lot of people thought that he was too strong-willed too strong-minded too stubborn 
when he found Tyson, he was kind of exiled um, to, to upstate New York and the Catskills. He wasn't really even training champions at that point. He had kind of been blackballed a little bit. And then he discovered Tyson, who was at a uh, reform school down the road. Uh, I think Tyson was like 12 years old. Yeah, Tyson had a rough upbringing, and people know that. In Brownsville. Uh, yeah, in Brownsville, and uh, was in a reform school out by the Catskills. Some of the guys that uh, trained with, with Cuss were, were counselors uh, at the reform school. And uh, one of them discovered Tyson, brought him to Customato. And uh, so Customato, his, like, everybody had to have a guy. And again, that's just the way business was done. And Customato's guy was uh, Charlie Antonucci, who went by the nickname Charlie Black, whose brother or half-brother or step-brother was Fat Tony Salerno, who was, you know, at the head of the table, at least on the street, for the Genovese crime family for quite a while. He's kind of like a, that. You see a picture of him. He's got a big cigar in his mouth, and he he just looks like a like a cartoon character of what a mobster would look like. There's a famous uh, video of him walking out of court and kind of. Barking at the, the the papers like he's the pen, or barking at the cameraman like he's the penguin. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Tyson's not shy about this. He just I just heard him on a podcast recently saying that uh, Charlie Black used to bring Tony Salerno up to Tyson's training camps, like before Tyson became champion. I'm sure Salerno was. By the time Tyson became champion, I think Salerno was locked up. But in the lead up to that, uh, as he was being groomed and and rising through the ranks, he's Tony Salerno's like five feet away from him, sitting there with Customato. That's interesting. I bet you he had some stories there. Yeah, and and I, I saw a funny um a funny uh interaction or uh, an account of an interaction where there was an old time boxing writer. I'm, I'm forgetting who he was. And I don't remember if I saw this on a, on like a, a boxing documentary or if I read it, but I remember them saying like Customato used to, whenever he would have the media by him, he would just start railing about the mafia and how the mafia had its, con- had its hooks into all the different sanctioning bodies and, all the different fighters and how he could never get a fair shake and he, how he was a one man, you know, fighting squad against the big bad mob. And this fighter or this uh, big popular prominent uh, boxing writer was like, I would sit with Cus after he would go on these tirades and the media would all go away. And I'd turn to him and be like, Cuss, like, what are you talking about? Like, if it wasn't for Charlie Black and Fat Tony, like, you wouldn't even be. And he's like, yeah, but you got to <laughs> hearts and minds, man. You, you got you know, to like, play the game. Yeah, gotta you got to play gotta, the game. Uh, even if you hate it. Yeah. So, I don't know. I just, I just thought it was uh, interesting to kind of chop up for a little bit. I would uh, recommend anybody that's interested in the genre or, or reliving that stuff. There's so much great stuff on YouTube of uh, fights from the not just the fights but just the way they were covered there was just so much pageantry it's like what the ufc is now but times a million because there were only three television networks and it just it just was such a it was so grand and uh which is an interesting story i wanted to share and i'm glad benny was here to share it with us and thanks benny yeah. Speaking of Tyson, he's got a fight coming up against Jake Paul. Jake Paul, right? Yeah. On July 20th. Uh, it says uh, exclusively on Netflix, I believe. How, how does it, so. if I'm Jake Paul's people, and I understand it's all money grab, it's all for clicks, it's all for content or whatever, but how do, how do you benefit at all? If you win, you beat up on a 60 year old. If he eats you alive, 
You got your ass handed to you by a six year old who hasn't fought in 20 years. 15 years. It's the money. It's the yeah. greed. And it's the the popularity, the fame. You know. Well, uh, everybody, please uh like, subscribe, share. Um, we're gonna be doing a little uh, more of these kind of uh, splitting the baby episodes not, not quite a quick hit or not quite a long form episode with a, a big interview but maybe like these like 30 25 to 35 minute uh breakdowns of some things and hope you guys enjoy them thank you benny um we will be back very soon here on the og pod i'm scott bernstein for benny <laughs>